um, uh, people will keep joining in uh, as we go, which is totally fine. Uh, so I'm Swapnil Hiramat and I'm uh, uh, I'm glad to have uh, an external speaker today at the Nephrology Grand Rounds in Ottawa, uh, Dr. Michelle Willicombe uh, from Imperial College, London. Uh, Dr. Willicombe is a senior clinical lecturer and uh, honorary consultant nephrologist at the Imperial College uh, Healthcare NHS Trust. Uh, her clinical interest is in transplantation and her research is all in uh, antibody mediated uh, transplant rejection, uh, which we will not be talking about today. Uh, she's also uh, been a covidologist uh, and has published uh, a lot of papers. Uh, it, it's wonderful how um, the, they could pivot the research also to study, uh, especially vaccine uh, efficacy uh, in, in CKD populations and different CKD populations. Um, so that's what she'll be talking about today on uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in patients with kidney disease. Uh, this, these rounds are being recorded and the recording will be available uh, later on uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. So with that, I'll let Michelle take it from here. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I sort of missed the uh, uh, antibody mediated rejection these days, but uh, yeah, with a huge focus on COVID, hopefully for everybody's sake, it, it will be over soon. Um, anyway, uh, in in terms of uh, COVID vaccines in people with kidney disease, um, we can consider both sort of immunogenicity as well as the clinical efficacy and clinical effectiveness. Um, but there's also other uh, considerations that need to be taken into account um, with regards to the subpopulations within um, renal, uh, for which there is a, a differing uh, efficacy of, of vaccines. Um, when you're looking at a um, data from vaccine efficacy, you need to consider how many vaccine doses the populations had, which vaccine type they've had, uh, and obviously which variant um, uh, is the dominant uh, uh, sort of variant of interest at any given time point. So there's lots of different things to consider. But outside of um, the clinical trials, and of course, um, as, as always, kidney patients were excluded from the, the main uh, vaccine uh, studies. Um, it's the real world data that has quite powerful um, impact. Uh, and there's already, certainly from the UK, several different uh, studies which are reporting uh, the vaccines or COVID vaccines having less efficacy or effectiveness in different kidney populations. So the first study to uh, note is the UK Open Safely data. So this is a ongoing study um, of 24 million people um, and the, the group have access to primary care records. And they reported uh, up to uh, data for up to November, so covering mostly the Delta period. And what they showed is that within the UK, the highest rates of breakthrough infections, so infections occurring after two vaccines, were occurring in people who had chronic kidney disease, who were on dialysis, who were immunocompromised, so including the transplant population and those with blood malignancies. So pretty much covering the whole of the, the, the renal population there. Um, not only were the um, renal population at higher risk of breakthrough infections, they also had were at highest risk of mortality um, with that breakthrough infection. Uh, and on unadjusted modelling, the, uh, the incidence or the death rate in um, uh, kidney transplant patients was three times higher than the uh, death rate in people over the age of, of 80 years, so quite alarming. There's also a uh, second data set which actually was, was published in JSON um, yesterday um, from the Scottish Renal Registry. So in Scotland, the uh, end-stage kidney disease programme uh, is over 5,000 uh, in size. Uh, and they were able to report that following two vaccines, vaccine efficacy or effectiveness was significantly less in those patients receiving kidney replacement therapy, so either dialysis or transplantation, compared with what was being reported in the UK general population. So 33% compared with 67 or, or 80%. Uh, and once again, they were reporting high mortality rates in people that were having breakthrough infections. So overall 9%, and this equated to 7% of dialysis patients and 10% of transplant patients 
um, of course, the, the transplant and dialysis populations have uh, differing underlying comorbidity profiles. And then very powerfully, um, this uh, January, so that last month that came out in transplantation, the UK uh, Transplant Registry or NHS Blood and Transplant uh, published their data on breakthrough infections following two doses of vaccine um, within the all of the solid organ uh, transplant recipients within the UK. And what they showed is that the vaccine uh, didn't seem to reduce the number of infections um, it did uh, impact on the risk of death by reducing it by 20%. But if you look at the overall mortality rate in transplant patients who have been uh, vaccinated with two doses of vaccine, mortality rate still 10%, so absolutely huge. So although um, these, um, these uh, real-world data are incredibly powerful, they sort of come after the event. And what we really want to know is the, you know, if we can predict what the responses are, are going to be like in, in kidney and in patients with kidney disease. And for that, we can look more at the immunogenicity studies. Um, uh, and I'm going to be speaking about the dialysis and transplant populations um, in, 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 in this presentation um, as the, the, the main examples of that. And already with the early data that came out, mostly from the US studies, so following mRNA vaccines, it was clear that the uh, vaccine effectiveness, effectiveness within these populations was not going to be uh, the same as for the general population or healthy controls. So first focusing on dialysis. Um, so the good news is that actually mRNA based vaccines seem to be quite uh, uh, sort of immunogenic in dialysis patients. So the uh, initial studies were reporting zero conversion rates of over 85% in dialysis patients following two doses of the mRNA vaccine. And this is just one of the studies um, that was published. There's been many study, studies since this time. And this is taken from the uh, Dialysis Clinic Network in the States, um, showing that in infection naive dialysis patients following um, uh, the Moderna vaccine, 96% of patients seroconverted, which slightly pipped the uh, Pfizer seroconversion rates. Um, both of which were significantly higher than the one-shot uh, uh, Janssen va vaccine. Um, this group also, because of the sh sheer volume, were able to, to look at um, other clinical variables associated with lack of, of immune response to the vaccine. And other than the vaccine type, uh, certainly the use of immunosuppression or history of immunosuppression uh, appeared to be a factor in uh, a risk factor in non zero conversion. Um, the beauty of this network is that they've been um, able to follow up their cohorts uh, prospectively and able to uh, report and publish on the vaccine effectiveness within their dialysis uh, population. And actually, um, the, the vaccine efficacy, this is just compared with other sort of within the dialysis population rather than healthy controlled appear to be holding up quite well. And even the, the Janssen vaccine, um, which had very poor sort of reported immune responses, wasn't too bad, um, although tiny numbers. So I don't think we can take any, um, uh, any, any take that to, to heart too much. Um, so to contraindicate what I've just said about Janssen holding up, I think also what I liked about this uh, network is that they were one of the first to show a significant correlation between seroconversion within the dialysis population and risk of subsequent infection, hospitalization and death. Uh, and they were able to show that um, half of their breakthrough um, infections, this was all after vaccination, so mostly due the the Delta period. So half of their breakthrough infections and all of their COVID related death occurred in dialysis patients um, with uh, no detectable antibodies, um, which is quite powerful uh, a, a reason to um, monitor these patients for um, zero conversion. 
So what about um, in the UK, um, like uh, I believe in, in Canada, but not to the same extent, we, we use significant amount of um, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine as the primary vaccine um, when rollout started in the early 2021. Um, so we're able to report in our cohort a comparison between the mRNA, um, which Pfizer mostly, and the uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. So we've been following up since um, over the past year um, uh, and for since the start of the pandemic, um, immune responses to all in all our dialysis patients. Um, but in terms of vaccine responses, um, we've reported on oh, just over a thousand patients. Of note, this was after the um, the Kent variant wave. Forty five percent of our dialysis cohort um, had evidence of prior exposure in West London. So huge, um, a huge percentage there. Um, but of the infection naive um, patients, we found that 86 percent of them uh, developed antibodies, so very much in keeping with what was being reported in the states. And we didn't see a significant difference in seroconversion rates between the mRNA and the AstraZeneca um, vaccines. Although when we looked at the antibody concentrations, concentration levels were um, significantly less in those patients who received AstraZeneca um, which is being reported now, not just in kidney patients, but obviously in the general pop population too. And to back up that, perhaps um, the dialysis patients may not, um, certainly those that had AstraZeneca may not have mounted a sort of a sufficient response to the, the vaccine. Um, we were part of a, a multi-centre study um, called a NAMI study looking at neutralising antibodies in dialysis patients. Um, and the group show, and this, this is the assay that's being used at the CRIC and, and being led by Ed Carr, um, basically showing that those patients, thousands of patients who had two doses of AstraZeneca um, ha, were less likely to have neutralizing antibodies against Delta um, after two doses of the vaccine um, compared with the, the, the Pfizer group. So there were a couple of, of Pfizer patients who didn't mount sufficient antibody response either, um, but it was it was a much more significant in the AstraZeneca cohort. So we then look back to see whether or not we could have predicted our breakthrough infections within our diocese uh, population. Um, similar to what the um, the dialysis um, clinic did in the, in the states, and because antibody wanes over time, what we did is divided up the uh, antibody concentrations or patients in by interquarter range of antibody levels following the second vaccine. Um, and what we we show that during the Delta period, so this was up to the 1st of um, December when Omicron took over, is that most of the uh, breakthrough infections occurred in people who had no or low antibody responses um, uh, at, at following the, the, the vaccination. So um, with that, um, and actually, I think we we were fairly confident we had a, re a relatively good understanding of zero responses, zero protection within our diocese cohort. Um, and then Omicron came along um, and uh, has caused much head scratching. Um, so first of all, in terms of the um, third doses, so um, the, our diocese population weren't prioritised for third primary doses of vaccine like the transplant patients, but the diocese patients were getting third doses as part of the booster programme within the UK. And a group in Birmingham um, have shown that following that third dose of vaccine, all the dialysis patients that they looked at to develop binding antibodies against Omicron, um, which was actually reassuring in terms of once again, the vaccine um, seemed to add an additional layer of protection for uh, against the Omicron um, onslaught. Um, and um, because of our patients were, um, half of them were received AstraZeneca, half of the mRNA vaccine, um, looking at the antibody levels following the third vaccine, we found a levelling up 
of the overall anti-S binding antibodies in those diagnosed patients who were previously vaccinated with AstraZeneca, who then subsequently received an mRNA dose vaccine. And all our third boost, our booster doses are all mRNA in the, um, in the UK. Um, this graph also shows how the antibody was waning um, prior to that third, bo uh, third boost. Um, but then more recent data, um, which came out of, um, was published in The Lancet two weeks ago, showed once again, perhaps those patients who had the AstraZeneca as their priming uh, vaccine, perhaps didn't mount a significant uh, neutralizing antibody concentration level um, against um, Omicron infection, um, which may highlight these, these patients are still at risk. Um, and lo and behold, but um, I said, I don't think this is a, 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 a pattern seen, seen solely in diagnosis populations in terms of breakthrough infections. Um, we reported, we have managed to report within our, our unit the first 145 Omicron infection cases. So this was up to um, the first sort of six weeks of the Omicron wave. And again, only, you know, the, the mere fact that over 10% of our population once again have been infected or reinfected um, was, was a huge problem. But what we uh, have managed to, to show is that those who actually, those patients who had their third dose of vaccine were, um, were afforded greater protection than those that had either were unvaccinated or um, received um, two vaccines alone. And we didn't see a significant difference between those who were primed with AstraZeneca versus Pfizer, um, as was suggested in the uh, Lancet paper. Um, but uh, early days and um, actually greater numbers that that may that may be borne out. Reassuringly, um, like a lot of um, other reports in um, the general population, we haven't seen excess mortality rates yet within um, within this um, infected cohort compared with the non-infected dialysis cohort. Um, but um, not all patients have reached 28 days out. And actually for a lot of our patients, the, the knock-on effect of uh, COVID-related death outweighs the, 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 the four-week cutoff period. Um, so we are continuing to observe very closely um, this po population. So um, moving on to the uh, transplant population, um, yeah, we, so definitely in terms of concern, these were our greatest concern um, together with the other immunosuppressed uh, patient populations. So the early studies that came out of the um, US mostly, uh, again, showing that the seroconversion rates following the mRNA vaccine was between Three and 65 percent. Three percent was actually from the French data rather than the American data uh, of patients receiving or maintained on the latter set therapy. Um, and there's been a load of data on um, immune responses in transplant patients. But what I've done is just highlighted the, the largest of the studies. So um, the largest study of the immunogenicity, um, and this is relates to antibody responses alone um, and binding antibody responses, uh, came out of the Johns Hopkins group um, in June time, uh, which showed overall in a patient population of, of six, uh, 658, 54% uh, of them had detectable antibody um, post-vaccination. But actually what's key in, a, in, in these studies, is especially as time's going on, is the ones, um, is the reporting of people who were infection naive. Um, and it was just under 50% of transplant patients who were infection naive who received two doses of the mRNA vaccine who had detectable antibody. Um, so significantly less than the dialysis population uh, and certainly than the uh, general population. Um, this is so once again um, the AstraZeneca and mRNA divide in the uh, UK population was seen in our transplant cohort too. Um, prior infection rates um, after um, at this, in the spring of 2021 
and we were seeing 16% of our transplant patients had been exposed to um, infection, um, which was significantly higher. A lot of other transplant centres around the UK were reporting about 3%. Um, so um, it shows that um, London was not a great place to be um, during the pandemic. Um, but comparing the AstraZeneca and Pfizer within the immunosuppressed population, um, we we saw that 55% of, of it, pre, people without or infection naive patients developed antibody. Um, and unlike the diastasis cohort, there was a significant difference between seroconversion rates in those who received AstraZeneca versus Pfizer. Um, and this uh, and the graph on the right is taken from the, the publication showing significant lower level of antibody in um, those patients who received AstraZeneca versus Pfizer, which even was borne out in those who'd had prior exposure. Um, but we, we knew from the uh, original vaccine studies that uh, AstraZeneca or the uh, vector-based um, vaccines had a more potent impact on the T cell responses. So it was important for us to look at that. Uh, and we uh, managed to uh, examine in a, a subset of 106 transplant patients. Um, and overall, only 11%, which was very uh, depressing indeed, of patients had a detectable T cell response. And we saw no difference between AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Um, and this graph on the right is a comparison of the um, uh, quantitative outputs from the, uh, the, the, the T cell assays uh, showing how AstraZeneca, uh, AstraZeneca compared with in transplant patients compared with healthcare workers uh, and similarly for the mRNA vaccine. I do think it's only fair that I uh, mention though in terms of the, the T cell um, uh, T cell assays, uh, more of the patients who received the AstraZeneca vaccine actually had were had received their transplant less than or received their vaccine less than one year post transplant um, because we had our hands on the AstraZeneca first. Uh, we thought these were the patients at greatest need of protection. So we were offering um, the first vaccine um, uh, available to these patients. So they were a slightly different uh, cohort. Um, but overall, um, it, we found, uh, as well as reported in many of the subsequent studies, that uh, there are a number of characteristics associated with lack of seroconversion in uh, transplant patients of older age, uh, transplant within um, vaccination within one year post transplant. Pfizer vaccine seems to be um, higher in terms of uh, zero response. Um, even on multivariate uh, variable analysis and immunosuppression burden seems to impact. And it's the um, antiperifatives, so mycophenate mofetil, um, which appears to be probably having the most great, the greatest effect on the immune responses. Um, so we, um, so third dose vaccines, so we were only allowed to give third primary dose to transplant patients in September. Uh, 2021, um, and they were all sort of mRNA based. But France um, were were um, given the right to, or were able to provide third doses for those transplant patients who had low or no immune responses following two as early as April, uh, and then the, the states followed them in June. Um, so the continued pattern of most of the data coming out of of France with, um, uh, and then to a lesser extent, um, the state sort of continued. So in terms of the third vaccines, um, uh, overall, a French group reported 68% overall um, uh, positive zero status in a transplant population of 396. But once again, if you look at those patients who were zero negative following two vaccines, less than 50% of them actually went on to, to zero convert. Um, uh, and what's, what was coming out of the, the big studies, and there were a number of uh, New England Journal of Medicine papers, is that for patients, for transplant recipients who had any response, 
a third vaccine boosted that response, which was good news um, because you probably increased their chances of actually um, developing uh, sufficient neutralizing antibodies. Um, but probably what um, we also need to concentrate on are the proportion of patients who were zero negative after the second vaccine who then don't subsequently develop any further immune responses. And um, the studies are reporting, you know, fifth, round about 50 percent there. There's still a significant amount. So um, we were interested, though, with because 50 percent non serial conversion um, after three doses is, is still quite a lot. So we were it, well, we were not pleased. That's the wrong word. Um, we were interested to see data coming out of um, both transplant recipients and the general population in ter terms of cov boost. that the mixing of vaccines, so the heterologous uh, dosing of the viral vector uh, and mRNA vaccine seem to um, produce uh, fairly robust um, serological as well as cellular responses in the transplant patients as well as um, the general population. So as I said, we, we were incredibly interested to see what that um, meant for our patients, certainly the ones who received AstraZeneca as priming. So um, we've we've now published this on a preprint server um, just to, to 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 get it out. Um, but we've looked at 700 uh, patients who were primed um, so had two vaccines, either with um, AstraZeneca or Pfizer, and then went on to have Pfizer as their third dose. Uh, and all vaccinations occurred in the post-transplant period because we've also seen that if you get those patients who were primed. Uh, whilst on the wait list, actually their responses, even in the post-transplant period to boosting, um, is 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 fairly good. Um, at this stage, so this was this was the the, the late Delta Omicron period um, that 20% of our transplant patients had seen um, the 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 infection at, at this stage. But what we found is that for the people that or the patients that were infection naive, 76 had detectable antibodies. Um, uh, but that still equates to 24 percent of our transplant recipients having no detectable anti-spike antibody. Um, again, they, although both the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer populations got boosted, um, patients who were primed with AstraZeneca are still lagging behind in terms of uh, zero conversion. Um, and when we look at the antibody concentrations in those primed with AstraZeneca versus Pfizer, AstraZeneca is still um, uh, falling short in terms of responses. Um, but we also able, because I think the, the, we've got quite large numbers, able to do some multivariable analysis. And we can see that it's the same risk factors that for non-response following two vaccines is the non-response following three vaccines. Um, uh, and we've also looked at the T cell responses, so much in a tiny, relatively tiny number of, of patients, only 30 patients. Um, who were infection naive, um, and uh, we were able to detect a T cell response in 40% of them. Um, no difference between uh, Pfizer and uh, Chadox at this time, um, both in a binary yes or no detectable T cells, but also uh, quantitatively um, as well. Um, so we, we didn't see any, we didn't see the promise of significant responses that were shown in uh, the general population in terms of mixing of vaccines yet. Um, and there has been a randomised control trial. Um, so it's not just our, our centre, it's, it's, it's nice to have uh, different data from, from other centres, but especially in a form of a randomised control trial. Um, so this group took 197 transplant patients who failed to uh, respond um, serial convert following two doses of mRNA vaccines and randomised them either to receiving a third dose of um, uh, mRNA or the Janssen vaccine. 
um, and they found no difference in zero con conversion rates, um, uh, but markedly actually much lower T cell responses than we found in our po population. But again, that may be due to different assays um, or perhaps even a, a the difference between Janssen. Uh, it's it's not we can't quite extrapolate. But overall, poor poor responses um, to that. Um, so I don't think in terms of continuing the mixing and matching of vaccines, I, I still I don't think it's I still think it's early days to draw rapid conclusions. But I think there's certainly enough data to say that the um, vector viral vaccines are just insufficient on their own in, in transplant patients. Um, so now moving to the fourth fourth doses. Um, so we were able to start in the UK giving fourth doses in December to those patient, transplant patients who were three months following their third primary dose. And this was in the response to the Omicron um, variant rather than to help transplant uh, patients specifically. Um, so I've actually just um, listed the three published studies, but there was another study out this week of 20 patients, um, which I haven't included. Um, but the, the, um, top, uh, the top row here is from the states, and there's a big mi mishmash of, of patients they've included here, and they've reported overall antibody detection in 83% of their patients. But they only included six that were antibody uh, negative, pre their fourth dose, and they report serial conversion rates of 50% in there. Now, the next two studies, um, uh, which are, um, are, are, are good studies um, from France, um, who, are, who were giving vaccines to patients either with low or no antibodies. So these are the only people in France, if I'm aware, pre-Omicron certainly, who were able to get fourth vaccines. Um, and if you note, so in terms of the zero negative, zero conversion rates were happening in, in 42, 50 percent after the, the, the fourth dose. Um, but what's really, um, I think, really powerful that's come out of the, 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 the French, um, the French, different French groups, um, they've done a lot of T cell work. They've also done a lot of work on neutralizing antibodies. Actually, they've shown a nice correlation. Um, between um, anti uh, anti S or anti R R B D and neutralizing antibodies, which has been shown in many sort of general population studies, but not in transplant patients before. Um, but importantly, what they're seeing or what they're reporting in France is that even if um, people patients are developing new zero um, or becoming zero positive following their fourth dose the antibody level of these patients is very low. And um, an important conclusion is that only 10% of those patients who had no detectable antibody after three doses mounted a sufficient antibody response. So as in would have a, an antibody level that perhaps would correlate with neutralizing antibody after fourth doses. And, and, and that's important because actually in terms of forward planning, um, it's not good if you if you're seronegative and you're transplant patient after three, the chances of then of you mounting a uh, significant antibody response after four are incredibly slim. And this was backed up by uh, another study by a different French group who've shown similar things. So, you know, the, the top line newspaper frontline report would go, yay, you know, 42 people have newly seroconverted after their third, after their fourth dose who were negative after their third. But actually, if you look at the 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 title or concentration of the antibody, it's incredibly low. And whether or not this 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 provides any uh, protection is 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 not it's just not known. Um, so we've um, in this uh, slide, I'm able to give some very preliminary data on our fourth dose responses. Um, we've only been able to screen 71 so far, but these people have been screened after each of the the vaccine. Um, and we're now up to 22% of our transplant patients have been exposed. And no doubt with Omicron, that's going to go, that's going to shoot up. But of the 55 patients um, who were infection naive within our um, patient, um, within our patient cohort, 18% remain seronegative after four, four doses. Um, so not even taking into consideration those that were weakly positive. 
um, 18 percent is actually a significant um, a significant number, especially if you think about you know, the number of transplant recipients there are both obviously in the UK and globally. Um, 18 percent or 56 percent here in the UK is is huge. Um, and of those that oh, there's an additional line. So those that were negative after um, so 10 that were negative after four, 15 um, were negative after three. So it's it's there is a little bit of zero conversion, um, but not significant amounts. So to um, summarise, in terms of transplantation, um, I've uh, I mean it, it's looking more more like that after the two vaccines, approximately 50 percent of patients have got a detectable antibody. This is not quantitative, this is yes or no. Uh, and then it appears from the data that's coming out that about 50% of, of non of seronegative transplant recipients will seroconvert after subsequent vaccines. Um, but this will this will come a time where we you know we say well it's it's not really worth repeatingly exposing or vaccinating these, these patients for you know relatively small numbers and perhaps other strategies may may be uh, may, may be more beneficial. Um, and then to summarize what the um, it, factors associated with non serial conversion, so age, immunosuppression type, immunosuppression burden, vaccination in the same year, um, vaccine type, and we haven't shown it, but others have reported a uh, an inverse correlation with antibody concentration and allograft function, um, which will probably have relevance to in the CKD and the various stages of the CKD population. So on my final, um, uh, what, uh, final one of my final slides, just want to highlight the responses in glomerulonephritis uh, and apologies, I've only got data following two um, vaccines. But like, um, like other populations, there's a marked variation in terms of what's been reported out there uh, in zero responses in those patients with glomerulonephritis. And that likely relates to what treatment anybody was receiving. So patients on the whole, um, what's been reported, who are receiving high dose steroids um, uh, uh, will have impaired responses. And those um, quite predictably who are receiving B cell depleting agents certainly when the B cells are still uh, deplete. Um, but what we, we have seen and others have reported as well is that even in the absence of uh, detectable B cell uh, response or antibody response, um, we can detect a T cell response in some of these, some of these patients. Um, and we didn't, unlike the transplant and other sort of populations, we didn't see a difference in um, T cell responses between as, uh, AstraZeneca and the uh, Pfizer vaccine, although with after a single vaccine, the AstraZeneca seemed to be more potent in terms of T cell responses in the patients receiving um, uh, uh, in, uh, immunosuppression for glomerulonephritis. Um, data, as far as I'm aware, and it may have changed because the data is always being updated, um, on vaccine efficacy in the uh, GN population, um, I'm not aware of um, currently. So to summarise overall, so the good news is the immunogenicity to the mRNA vaccines um, is good in people receiving dialysis, um, but breakthrough infections are common in the Omicron era and, and actually all the prior rules to um, reinfection and uh, levels of protection um, have sort of gone out the window a little bit with Omicron. Uh, immunogenicity to the all vaccines are weaker in people receiving immunosuppression. Um, and uh, new seroconversion in terms of the transplant recipients is likely to occur when you give, um, give a population an additional vaccine. But the quality, um, quantity neutralizing ability um, is, it may be uh, insufficient uh, to, to, to protect these patients. Um, and there is probably going to be a proportion of immunosuppressed patients. So um, for the 18% of our patients who have it mounted after four, we definitely need a different strategy for them. Um, and we're not able to give pre-exposure prophylaxis currently in, in the UK, which probably should change this population. 
Um, now, this is my final slide, I promise. Um, so the, the, this just li lists the um, current immunogenicity and vaccine efficacy studies that are occurring um, in the UK, um, people with kidney disease. So the Octa Duo, I think, will be a very important paper. So this was um, comparing different immunosuppressed populations um, who got randomised to either Pfizer or uh, Moderna as their third vaccine. Uh, and I'm not aware, certainly within this population, that there's been a direct comparison before. Um, certainly data suggests that Moderna seems to be more immunogenic overall, but um, this will be an incredibly useful trial uh, and actually hopefully will inform ongoing policy within, within the UK. The NAMI study I've, I've uh, referred to is a neutralising antibody uh, study um, in the diabetes population, and this is a, a UK-wide um, uh, initiative. And actually, we may change just from diabetes patients uh, and include some GN and, and transplant patients too. And then the Melody study is a study that I'm I'm heading up, um, which is uh, there to assess because assess the use of um, finger prick antibody tests for vulnerable populations. And we're including the uh, autoimmune patients on B cells, depleting agents, blood malignancies and transplant patients. And we're including up to 36,000 patients who are being invited to take part. Um, but in, as well as, you know, we, we, we hope, we're hoping for data to correlate immune responses with vaccine um, vaccine efficacy or effectiveness, but also additionally where we're collating a lot of information with regards to the immunosuppression patients are on and the timing of the immunosuppression with the, the vaccines and responses and also a lot of behavioural uh, behavioral and um, mental health type and um, questions that will hopefully be very informative for immunocompromised patient groups moving forward. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all my colleagues at Imperial who've been helping with all the work that we've been producing. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a fantastic uh, overview of the of the whole topic of of vaccines and um, COVID. Um, uh, if, if people have questions, please uh, raise your hand. But I'll I'll start the ball rolling. Uh, one of the things that has been extremely impressive about uh, the UK has been how you have been able to do pivot and do all these research studies like recovery and of course everything that you have done. Um, I, I struggled. I was trying to get antibody testing and I could not get it done locally. Um, how how could you you know how was this possible? What is the secret sauce that uh, that you had? So I th I can only so the recovery study was amazing in terms of you know they that was that was right from the top um, that was government saying we are doing a single study everybody gets into this trial and actually it did deliver um, and it's continuing to deliver and that's a very good strategy moving forward but a lot of the regulation stuff in the UK was lifted um, so it was much easier to get. Ethic, ethics approval for COVID related work. So for all the local work, we we got ethics through within like 48 hours of writing the application. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And, and you know, it's never happened before. Um, and already it, the, the bureaucracy is starting to slide back in. You can see it with subsequent studies. Um, but I mean, it just shows there was a need for it. People wanted it, you know, everybody, it just made sense and it worked because I said a load of the red tape just got cut. Um, so even for the local small studies like mine, um, we were able to just get cracking straight away um, because people went, yeah, that sounds sensible, you know, go for it. Um, uh, but I think we have been, I, 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 yeah, I think, I think we're slipping back already, which is, which is, which is sad. Yeah, and, and we are all, I think the entire world is grateful for all the research that has come out. Um, but uh, I think Greg uh, has a question as well. Go ahead, Greg. Great, uh, great presentation. Sorry, I, I missed the start of your talk and, and maybe I covered this, but there's really been uh, limited data on the clinical real world effectiveness of a lot of these uh, vaccines at the population level in, in transplant patients. And 
Uh, we've done a study here in the province of Ontario. We have a data set um, of all all healthcare encounters. So we have a, a study under review now that includes 12,000 solid organ transplant uh, patients. Right. And it's just the follow up's just up till the end of uh, November. So it's pre Omicron. And we actually showed it is very nice. One of your last few slides where you had the serial response rates um, summarized at 50% after two doses and 75% after three doses. It's basically what we saw. So for clinical vaccine effectiveness, we saw uh, 46 percent after two doses and 72 percent after the third dose and that's to prevent any infection and to prevent hospitalization and death it was 52 percent and 63 percent so obviously much much lower than the general population but i think encouraging to show that the third doses seem to parallel the data you're showing with uh, uh serial response rates yeah, I, did. I referred to um, the real world data that coming out of the UK in terms of transplantation at the start. Uh, and, you know, it's that, that there is still a population of great concern, especially now when, you know, all restrictions and everything have been let go. Um, so that would be really powerful. Have you, have, is that published yet? Under review. <laughs> Amazing. No, I look forward to reading that. That, that, that sounds brilliant really important because that's what we need we need that data to 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 show you know policy makers that you know it, that these patients are still although we've made improvements they're still at risk exactly um yolanda yeah <clears throat> We are all worried about our renal transplant patients. We're certainly in this wave seeing a significant amount of illness and morbidity. Um, so I guess my question is, um, we've always struggled because they've been asking us for a year whether they can get their antibody <laughs> level measured. And we've always said kind of, well, what are we going to do with that information? <clears throat> but, you know, we seem to understand the antibody levels a bit more. Um, can you comment? Do you think there's a clinical role uh, for measuring antibody level um, to guide, you know, counseling or, um, you know, further boosters or early testing or early treatment uh, in a cohort of patients. Um, and, and when would we do that? How would we, like, what would be the timing of uh, identifying those people at risk? So um, I, I, I absolutely think we should be measuring antibodies. So we've got a lot of, um, we, we, we have heated discussions within the UK Kidney Association sort of working group with regards to the utility of them. Um, and the fact that, you know, we're not measuring neutralizing antibodies against, you know, Omicron variant, blah, blah, blah. And that's absolutely true. But I think we're at a stage where it would be good to know people who have no responses. If they've got no responses, they haven't got any neutralizing antibodies, they're probably not protected. And there's probably enough data coming out to show that's the case, uh, more so in dialysis than transplant patients. But there's cohorts reporting seronegative people getting infection and then uh, dying, especially in the Delta period. So I think so. Um, I'm, I'm writing a piece now uh, of my opinion status that I think we should be doing this for our patient population. Um, because you can target, I think you can then target certain groups, certainly the ones with no antibody responses. They may be the ones who may benefit from pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the areas which is more grey, then they can go into studies in terms of you know, pre-exposure versus, versus not. Um, in terms of timing, um, the antibody, so the low level antibodies wane quite quickly following vaccine alone. In, certainly in the transplant patients. Um, but, you know, actually, even if you do it at a random time, if they've got no antibody, they've got no antibody. I do get the ones who've developed, so what we found from the vaccine studies is those that develop even a tiny response who get a subsequent boost are in a better position than those without any antibody whatsoever. So if you want to do it correctly, it'd be doing it, you know, you know, the ideal time, 28 days after. But actually, as long as you, you know, as long as you take into account possible waning, um, you could possibly just for pragmatic purposes, do it at any any time, as long as, you, you know, you can you, you, you somehow know that you that there will be a degree of antibody waning. The problem will be if you do it at sort of nine weeks and they're negative, you don't know whether or not they're in the completely no response 
or the low response one because it would probably be negative in both. Uh, and, and on that same note, uh, you know, like we have done the two doses, we have done the three doses in transplant patients. Now we are doing the fourth dose. Um, I don't think uh, we are done with COVID yet. Um, <laughs> do, do you see a do you see a fourth and a fifth and a sixth? And will you know? Uh, some people are talking about right. They're getting frustrated with these boosters coming yeah. forever. Uh, but we do see the waning of antibodies, and especially yeah. in our populations. Uh, would this be useful uh, to guide further dosing? Uh, you know, and do you anticipate that we'll be needing dose number five and six? And yeah, so I mean, my 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 gut now says. I mean, certainly we are getting more and more people, even dialysis patients, especially transplant patients, not bothering. You know, they they've lost. They're getting vaccine fatigue, we call it. You know, they, they've they've had had enough. You get, you know, you get some at the front of the line every time that a new booster is announced. But more and more people are getting more and more relaxed about it. I don't see the point if you're a transplant patient and you've had four vaccines and you've had no response whatsoever to four vaccines. I. I'm I'm becoming unless you can change the vaccine somehow, maybe you know, sort of if you're changing it to Moderna, if the data suggests that's superior, perhaps. But I think I think with the evidence that certainly the um AstraZeneca uh, monoclonal antibody seems to be still holding up against Omicron, it just seems to me until we, until we're better, till we're in a better position globally. I think perhaps pre-exposure prophylaxis for the non-responders after four may be better than repeated vac vaccination. So I don't think there's a stage where some people just won't respond, just like, you know, hepatitis B, they're not going, not going to respond. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Dr. Noel? Uh, again, I apologize if you talked about this at the start. Did you mention about adjusting immunosuppression prior to the vaccination? So. Um, the subset of complete non-responders, you know, if there's any trials, for example, of taking them off their cell sept, uh, yeah. giving them their series and seeing if they respond. Yeah, I didn't um, I didn't refer to this. There are studies. Um, so there's, uh, I think it's Germany that have done one in terms of stopping the uh, randomized control trial in terms of stopping the cell set versus not. I haven't seen the results of that yet. But again, it'd be very interesting to see if by stopping the cell set, even if you get a serious response, was it worth it? You know, is you know what sort of quality of of response are you going to get? Um, I'd be hugely anxious about stopping the cell set, to be honest. Um, in in order to to hope for a vaccine response, I think um, I think Dori Segev is is planning to do a study as well, isn't he? On 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 this too. But we we think in terms of messaging. Um, and we have worked with patient groups that the, you know, a message of you can hold your MMF pre this would be would be disastrous for transplant recipients. You know, other forms of immunosuppressed patients, it may be completely possible, um, but we, we, we don't want to particularly go there um, uh, unless, you know, I, I mean, they're brave for doing it, but I don't know. What are your thoughts? I totally agree about the messaging. You don't want to be giving this mixed message kind of, um, but it would be interesting, you know, to see if there was a, you know, a robust and prolonged response, you know, if they were off it for a month or I'm not sure how long you would have to keep them off of. I mean, it would obviously be, and I'm, I'm assuming the people doing these studies are very stable people that are probably two years post transplant, et cetera, et cetera, you know, previously always quite compliant. Like I bet it's going to be a very highly selective uh, yeah. group of people, you know, and whether you boost the tacrolimus a little more and all these sorts of tinkering. So I, I think it would be interesting scientifically, I, I guess yeah. I agree with you, uh, widespread to sort of say, oh, just hold your cell sept and we'll get your, all your vaccines done may not be the best. No. Approach. We're a bit worried about Paxlovid coming out. I mean, that's going to, that's going to, I mean, if, if we're going to have to I mean, they, it's going to be started. It's going to, uh, even if with with warnings in regards to interactions. Um, uh, yeah. So I think if you if we're saying right, stop MMF. There's Paxlovid. There's everything. You just think, oh my gosh, finish <laughs> off my biopsy again. <laughs> <laughs>
lots going on. Um, and and slightly different, you know, sort of naive question I have, um, uh, and if others have questions, please raise your hand, is uh, the antibodies, right? I mean, there were a bunch of different assays out there, and there was all this question about, you know, is this assay better, IgM, IgG? Uh, neutralizing uh, is there you know if 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 ever we go down that path if I'm able to convince the powers that be to do this uh, do you have any advice about you know what is the best strategy in terms of you know choice um, I think any of the you know any of the, the the large sort of commercial assays the you know we use Abbott Roche is also used um, uh, and again so I know like the French use Abbott and it's very nice to be able to sort of correlate we're seeing what that what they're seeing um i don't think in terms of neutralizing antibody so it's never going to be you know it's 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 with the there's no, it's not high throughput which means it's never going to be able to be used clinically um uh so um yeah i i think i think any of the commercial assays and i'm sure that over time that you know they, they will change depending upon what's in the vaccine but the vaccine at the moment still has the original wuhan wuhan sort of spike which means that all the all the um assays are currently working but i definitely think in terms of in terms of our immunosuppressed population there is a there the, you know, knowing and, and and having the ability to test for antibodies, I think, is uh, is is an important one. Yeah, yeah, we we do agree on that. It's just about being able to convince the people to to make it happen. Um, if if there are no other questions, uh, I would like to thank Michelle again for this wonderful overview of the topic. And and we are really, you know, we would like to congratulate you on all the research you've done. And we are truly grateful uh, for all the data coming out of there. Uh, hopefully, you know, we will be able to host you once uh, sometime in the future in person once, oh. uh, once <laughs> the pandemic is done. Thank you. Lo lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.